chapter 15 of our textbook gets into the expenditure cycle. Now, a lot of this is already going to look kind of familiar to you because you've seen it from the opposite perspective in the revenue cycle. But there are a couple of changes when we look at it from this perspective. And so this slide deck and this chapter is going to kind of walk through what some of those elements are. In particular, you want to pay attention to what are the artifacts being created. In other words, what are the paper source documents that we're going to be using that go back and forth between our companies? Now, obviously, you probably want to do this digital in a more sophisticated environment, but the root kind of model is very much passing documents back and forth. So when we talk about this, we're literally looking at ordering goods and services. And now again, when we think about this, it seems like a whole lot of extra effort. But you have to understand that we're not just ordering a single cappuccino at Starbucks. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars, thousands of purchases. I mean, we're doing lots of these elements. And so we can very quickly get into very significant amounts of money. And so because of that, we have to have more controls about it. We also need to think about receiving as well. What are the key elements in handling our inventory and our goods? And then, of course, we need to think about controls. How are we mitigating threats? We also have an approval process we're going to talk about and talk about those threats, and then cash disbursement. Now, when you look at the risks in organizations, cash is almost always at the top of the list. Cash is very easy to steal compared to a lot of other things in an organization. So we have a lot of controls before we pass that along. All right, so kind of we break this process down to four major sections. We have the ordering process, the receiving process, the approval process, and then cash disbursement. And these are sort of the four basic things we're going to do in the expenditure cycle. So we can kind of break this down in different departments and sort of walk through the process here. So we start off with the production department. So production department is making some kind of item for us, and they need more raw supplies or materials. So they're going to talk to the purchasing department. They might ask, well, why don't they just order it themselves? Why do we need purchasing to do this? Well, in most organizations, we're going to centralize the purchasing decisions because it's better if we can have people focus full time on a task. Production is great at making things, but they've got different priorities and different skill sets. Purchasers are going to go around and they're going to spend their whole time trying to get the best possible price on a good. All right, so purchasing department is going to go talk to the supplier. They're going to ask the supplier for some sort of product. Supplier will tell them the price and the purchasing department will then send an agreement to actually sell those for that specific price. Suppliers then are going to send their items to a shipper. So this could be FedEx, UPS, it could be a specialized logistics provider, but most suppliers of large amounts of equipment are not going to take a truck and deliver it to you themselves. These are then taken in by the receiving department. Now again, notice the separation of concerns here. Production needs the stuff that we have. Purchasing orders the stuff, and then receiving department gets the stuff. And the idea here is that, again, we're splitting up jobs to have more accountability and more controls. The receiving department takes the things and stores them into a warehouse. They're then going to let purchasing department know that we have the items that they wanted. Now, at a certain point after the delivery, the supplier will record a transaction in their accounting book saying that we've finished this sale. Now, it could be that it sort of triggers at the delivery point or the ship point based on the terms of sale. But at some point, they're going to actually record, yes, we've got this done. Now we want you to pay us for what we sent you. The purchasing department is going to go to our CFO and get approval for this transaction to be paid. The CFO is going to tell the AP department, the accounts payable department, that it's okay to pay the supplier. And then they're going to send the check and remittance memo to the supplier. But again, think about all the different separations of concerns here. We've talked about ARC, where we separate out the authorization, the recording, and the custody. And that's what we see we have here. The AP people are going to have custody of the cash. The CFO is going to approve it. The purchasing department kind of coordinates the middle piece over here, but never gets custody because the receiving department gets custody. And so again, we're splitting up the different pieces to make sure everyone's doing just their part and we have accountability. We have a range of different documents being created throughout this process. The first one you'll probably see is a purchase requisition. So this is coming out of the production department to the purchasing department and basically tries to say what exactly production needs. Usually this is going to say things like quantity, it's probably going to have time, like when do we need this item in, 
and also things like quantity, quality, uh, different options available. The purchasing department is going to get a sales quote from the supplier. So the sales quote specifies what the supplier can sell us and for what terms. We then send a purchase order that basically is our legal uh, agreement to take part in this process. A supplier is going to ship their items with some kind of bill of lading and some sort of way of transferring ownership of the items to us. We're going to get a receiving report. A receiving report comes from the warehouse saying, here's what we actually got from the vendor. And then we're also going to get a sales invoice. So all these things together, the purchase requisition, the receiving report, and the sales invoice and purchase order are all elements that the purchasing department is going to sort of combine and make sure that they all align. And this is because in the real world, these things might differ. Production might have asked for 200 units, but then we decided to order 220 because we get a slightly better price that way. But then we only had 205 actually shipped, and the receiving department says actually one of those was broken, and we ended up returning it for a refund. So when the purchasing department gets all these different documents together, they have to sort of align them all so that the CFO can see on the voucher, voucher package what we actually need to pay for. So CFO approves this, and then the remittance goes with a check to our supplier so they know, hey, here's a check for you know, $2 million. Here's how we calculated the bill, and here's the accounts and invoices that you need to apply it to. So there's a lot of decisions here. One of the most important decisions you'll handle in a supply chain management sort of focus is what's the optimal level of inventory. Every item that we keep in our warehouse is money that is just sitting there. So we wanna make sure we've got the minimum possible inventory. But we have to balance that out with the idea that if we run out of inventory, we can't sell any items. And so you wanna have some inventory, but not too much. We're also gonna think about suppliers. Which suppliers can we go to that will have the best quality at the best price? Or we might even not even say best, we might say the acceptable level of quality at the best price. You might also think not just about best price, but also uh, some amount of redundancy. You might need to have not just one supplier, but you might need to have a second or third supplier just in case the first supplier can't give us what we need on a good time. Some suppliers might be really good at giving us things fast and cheap. Others might be uh, cheap but slow. So there's a balancing of supplier management here. We want to think about using I2 to improve the efficiency and accuracy of these logistics process. So again, it's a lot of documents, a lot of coordination. And so doing this on a system instead of paper obviously has some significant advantages. We want to think about vendor discounts. So if you go back to the AP office here, most uh, vendors will give us discounts if we pay them quickly. And so the AP has to decide what discounts do I want. Maybe this supplier has a 2% discount, but another supplier has got a 3% discount. So we might pay the 3% one first and then hold off on the 2% discount. And our goal here is to maximize our cash flow. We want to make sure that we're getting dollars coming into the organization and out again. And you think about it, there, there's a lot of processes here, right? But the goal is that whatever we receive in our warehouse, we want to sell that as quickly as possible and we want to slow down the payment of our suppliers as quickly as possible. And the longer that we can stretch the difference between these two activities, the selling versus the paying for supplies, basically determines how much cash do I need to run my business. Imagine a car lot where you're selling brand new Ford uh, vehicles, Ford trucks like F-150s, right? If I have to buy a truck, let it sit on my lot for six months and then sell it, that's a lot of cash tied up. But what I can do is, what if I can delay paying my supplier for two months? Well, now I only need four months of cash for that truck instead of six months of cash for that truck. So what are some of the threats? We again have this problem with master data, inaccurate or invalid. So what this means is, as I'm sending things back and forth, I have to think about where do all these items go and who are the right people to talk to them. With the remittance advice again, it would be really easy for someone to go in and change an address. Maybe what we do is we have a clerk in the AP department change the, the address on a check to go to their own personal house. They then deposit the money for two or three days, get interest on it, and then pay the supplier. So things like that are kind of a common way of scamming money out of an organization. They can advantage of this sort of cash float. 
We want to make sure we don't disclose sensitive information. That could be how much we're ordering. It could be what price we're paying. We don't want to lose our data and just general poor performance. We want to do this process as quickly as possible. So what are some controls? Well, we're going to restrict access to the master data. Not everyone should be able to go in and change an address. We're also going to review and log all changes to master data. We're going to log who changed every single detail for our suppliers and know so we can go back and look at this as an audit log. We'll do access controls and encryption to try and help our processes work smoother and be more secure. We're going to have backup recovery processes. And of course, we're going to have managerial reporting. So if you think about this whole cycle, I'll probably want to ask the question, if I'm the purchasing department manager, how many items are currently in process right now? Where are we? Are we waiting on a lot of sales quotes? How are the suppliers performing? Is shipping doing well or poorly? Have we paid? You know, all those sorts of things. So you'll need reports to kind of show you the status of these elements. All right, so we think about the, the individual items. Uh, we can, again, look at these source documents. We have this purchase requisition, we have sales quote, and we have purchase order. And each of these has a specific goal. So the purchase requisition is going to say what, when, and how much do I want to purchase. A sales quote will get me the price, availability, and terms. And the purchase order is going to actually authorize the purchase. So again, we go back to our diagram here. That's sort of the first three elements in the process. So here's an example of a purchase requisition. So this is something that production is going to send to purchasing. And they're going to say what they need and possibly justify why they need it, and especially say when do they need it. A sales quote could come from the supplier and goes to your purchasing department. This is when the business tells us what is available for how much and when we can deliver it. And then a purchase order then is going to come from purchasing to our supplier, which is our promise to pay. So we're going to tell them exactly what it is that we're willing to do. And again, their revenue department is supposed, the revenue cycle is supposed to sort of match up and make sure this is aligned with what they could actually do. All right, so what are the major threats and controls? Well, the threats, we can look at inventory. We don't want to have stock outs, and we don't want to have excess inventory. And so as the purchasing and production department, they're going to work together to make sure that they have enough supplies so that production is not messing up. We also want to make sure we don't have too much inventory. Right? That's just as bad because we're just taking up too much cash. We want to make sure that we don't purchase items that are not actually needed by the organization. And this could be we are used to ordering a bunch of items for products A, B, and C, but C is seasonal, and we're not going to sell them again for six months. So you may want to back off on ordering. We don't want to purchase items that inflate the prices or purchase items of poor quality. So this kind of gets at the purchasing department itself. Purchasers have a lot of incentives that can go badly. You know, imagine that you've got two different possible vendors, vendor A and vendor B. Vendor A gives me a slightly better price. Vendor B gives me a slightly better quality. Well, I could be motivated to go for the better price because it looks better for me to spend less money on things. Or maybe vendor B gives me a little kickback, and then I choose vendor B instead, even though it's a higher price. And those kickbacks could be things that are monetary, like direct cash under the table. Or it could be things like free tickets to a basketball game, or an invitation to come to a fancy dinner at a restaurant. Um, and these can be couched in a lot of different ways. It could be that the salesman comes to your purchaser and says, hey, I want to have a discussion over lunch with you about this. So you go to lunch, but he chooses a really, really nice restaurant that you couldn't afford on your own. It says, you know, why don't you bring your wife along as well? And then the brand wife comes along as well. And then the purchase, the uh, salesperson says, you know what? I actually have something else I got to do. I'm going to just, you know, close the check for you. You guys enjoy your lunch. And they, they leave after five minutes. And so you've gone from a fairly harmless conversation to they just gave you a really nice dinner at a restaurant. So what are some controls? Most companies are probably going to want a perpetual inventory system. We want to always know how much inventory we have on hand through things like barcoding or RFIDs. We're also going to want to check to make sure that what we have in the warehouse matches what's in our records through things like periodic physical counts. We're going to talk about centralized purchasing. Right? We're going to want to coordinate and have a lot of oversight of this process. We'll use things like price lists, use competitive bids, and definitely some kind of list of approved suppliers. Anytime you have a new supplier come online, you definitely want to have some extra oversight of that process. 
Other issues might be unreliable suppliers or purchasing from people that are not approved. So we're going to monitor the supplier performance. We're going to make sure that we only buy from approved suppliers that are, have some level of oversight in our firm. We're going to prohibit gifts. And one big one is job rotation and mandatory vacations. So just by requiring people to take two weeks of a uh, break a year can actually discover a lot of problems in an organization. Say, for example, someone in the accounts department is skimming off the top and they're depositing payment checks for a couple of days in their personal account. Well, if they're doing this, often they'll start using that money for them themselves and then they'll realize that at some point they can't unspool the fraud. And the fraud tends to get larger and larger the farther on this sort of fraud process uh, happens. But if I can take that person out of the equation for a week, often I'll discover issues like that when someone else comes in and reconciles records. Receiving. How do we track when goods arrive? Well, we're going to verify that the goods actually match the purchase order. And this will be comparing the receiving report and sending it back to the purchasing department. We also will have a bill of lading which transfers our ownership. And again, just like the revenue process, this process changes. Uh, it's not the same for every business out there. This is sort of a general overview of the entire process, which is going to be customized for different firms. So here's an example of a bill of lading. We get this from the supplier and receive by receiving. And the key here is what's supposed to be on the truck. And you'll notice one thing that's not on here is the prices. The people that receive items are not supposed to know how much things actually cost. That's out of their, out of their environment. And with the bill of lading, often we'll want them to double check that what's on the truck matches the bill of lading. And so the receiving department usually is not going to be told the exact number of items arrived or ordered. That way, they have to actually check it and count it themselves. This so receiving report goes into purchasing to see what we actually got. So what are the threats? Um, we don't want to accept unordered items, which sounds probably weird, right? Why would a company send more than what you ordered? Well, this is a classic way of faking sales. So imagine that our supplier sends us 200 goods instead of 100 goods. Well, what they're doing is they're booking the 200 unit sales as revenue to make their revenue look better. Now, they know we're going to return them or ask for credit or something, but they don't really care because they're just trying to make their quarterly bonus. So you don't want to accept unordered items. We want to make sure that we count things accurately and that things are not being stolen by people in the warehouse. So what are some things here? Well, we make sure that we have authorized purchase orders. We're going to use barcodes or RFIDs. We're not going to tell them how much we've actually ordered. We're going to audit to make sure stuff's actually there. And we're going to try and separate custody versus receiving. And the idea here is that the person that's at the loading dock might take an item or two and not report it. But then when it gets delivered to the storage facility, they're going to count it and realize that they're short. And it'll help us find problems faster. All right, so now we have the approval of the invoice and the cash disbursement. This is a matching step. We want to make sure that everything aligns properly. And there might be some disagreements here. Maybe we ordered 100 items, but they could only give us 90. Well, we might have decided, OK, that's still all right. Or maybe of the 90, one was delivered broken. OK, so we're only going to pay for 89. So there's just all this reconciliation process that happens when we kind of compare all these documents. So here's an example of an invoice. It comes from the supplier to purchasing, saying to please pay us. And then we take all of this together and build a voucher packet. And the idea here is that purchasing shouldn't have the ability to actually send cash. That's uh, too much of a separation of, of ARC. Uh, we really want to split up the separation of concerns. So purchasing is going to send to the CFO a, a document that contains all these different pieces and sort of explain how they all fit together. The CFO then is going to say, OK, I authorize this, and then accounts payable will actually send the check. The check should have a remittance advice attached saying, what does this actually apply to? And this will help the revenue side match payments to the right invoices. So again, just this package has a bunch of different elements here. And you notice it's got different departments as well, all kind of working together to be checks and balances for each other. So this approval has some other threats. Um, obviously, we could have some errors. The supplier may invoice us for 100 items, even though they only ship 90. 
and only 89 were actually good. We also need to make sure there's no mistakes in posting, that we, all of these go to the right accounts. And so again, we'll have a lot of controls here, uh, again, with reconciliation and verifications. Cash disbursements. One of the problems might be that we were going to pay early to get a discount, but then we didn't actually take the discount when we paid them. We don't want to do duplicate payments. We only want to pay for something one time. We want to prevent theft of cash being sold and make sure that no alterations happen on the check. And all this goes back to cash flow. One of the primary goals of our business is going to make sure that we know what, where our cash is and make sure we're receiving and paying it out at the proper time. So some of the controls, we're going to make sure we file things by the due date. We're going to do a lot of matching. We're going to cancel documents once payments has been made. This could be a physical you know, stamp on something or a check in a system. We're going to split up our separation of duties so the person who writes checks is not going to also reconcile the bank account. Our checks might have special protection applied to them, like special paper, or we might just do all of this digitally. Nowadays, you probably see this happen where we do electronic checks and payments back and forth. And then, of course, we're going to have a way of tracking our cash flow for the organization. So these are some key terms that you should kind of be aware of that are discussed a little bit more in detail by our book, um, but you also see them in supply chain classes. But if we go back to the, the central goal here, this is the reverse of the revenue cycle. So you should be fairly comfort comfortable talking through the different pieces, be able to put them in the right order, and understand what the key documents are at each step. You also need to think through what each of these is giving us as well, right? Who's involved? What's the order of the process? And then what are the key documents at each step? So as long as you can kind of keep those major elements in line, you'll probably be pretty good in understanding the expenditure cycle.